Welcome everybody. It's another video version of the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine, our weekly podcast and our look into integrative medicine and lifestyle choices around Western Pennsylvania. We've got uh, a new print issue coming out this week. You should start seeing it around all your favorite healthy uh, places, healthy uh, grocery stores, yoga studios, and uh, lots of waiting rooms. We have many doctors have it now in their waiting rooms. And it features a cover story by our friend Dan Wagner. He talks about the end of antibiotics. This is not a big scare tactic. This is just the reality. The reality is in 20 or 30 years, we may not be able to use antibiotics at all. And we have to plan for that. Then we have another story by Dennis Courtney. He talks about ozone therapy. Ozone therapy is still experimental, says the FDA. Still illegal, says the state boards. But the FDA says, well, you can test it now in Pennsylvania. And Dr. Courtney is one of very few doctors in our state that is now licensed to do that. So you want to find out more about that. And, of course, we have lots of stories from the uh, integrative medicine professionals, what I call the imps, uh, around western Pennsylvania. You've got a great set of articles this time, and I hope you enjoy that issue. Today is June 3rd. We're getting right into the Arts Festival this weekend, and a lot of things on the calendar. We like to do a calendar uh, starting out every show and uh, catch you caught up on what is going on in western Pennsylvania. We normally record about 4 o'clock on Tuesdays and then put this podcast out on YouTube iTunes, Spreaker, Stitcher, and soon other implements of destruction as soon as uh, our engineer Mike, the bionic man, Sorg, can find them. Uh, this week we've got a great uh, guest coming up, uh, Sheldon Ingram. You've seen him on TV on Channel 4 as a news reporter, and if he's ever wearing a tight shirt in the summertime, you may have noticed the guy is ripped, and I do mean ripped, and he is a uh, healthy from the inside out and he's going to talk to us about his new certification as a certified holistic health coach and that was a great conversation i had with him over the weekend so first i'd like to have a little word from our sponsor we've got uh, a new sponsor for our journal and that is get organically social or as we know it organically social uh, think the entertainment book or think Groupon, uh, but it's just for health and wellness, and you get a car to carry around, and all the uh, sponsors provide uh, great uh, 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 specials every month. And so you want to find out more about that because there's uh, a whole bunch of really cool places that are going to be in this network, and those cards are going to be available starting up this summer. So get on over to getorganicallysocial.com and see the list of who's on board so far. So let's get into our Journal of Lifestyle Medicine calendar for uh, June. June is going to be a busy month. Um, around the 20th to the 22nd of uh, June, the, the solstice, so much stuff is going on. I can't even believe all these things are happening. June 20th, we've been talking about this a lot. Uh, the Himalayan Institute spiritual head, Pandachi, uh, Pandit Rajmani Tiganat, will be in town at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, that is a Friday night, I believe, and he is going to be talking about the first of four. He's got four translations uh, of the Yoga Sutra coming out, and this is just the first uh, one. And so he'll be actually doing um, a presentation or doing a little uh, uh, class for us. And you can find all about that in last week's podcast we had with Kate Kell the uh, director of the Himalayan Institute in Pittsburgh. So that's one thing. The second thing is that Matthew Fox, probably one of the most profoundly knowledgeable spiritual voices on the planet, former Catholic priest, current Episcopalian priest, founder of Creation Spirituality, uh, he is going to be in Pittsburgh at the First United Methodist Church in Shadyside, uh, good friend Gail Ransom is going to be host. She's actually a graduate. Her PhD is from his university, the uh, Creation Spirituality University uh, in Berkeley. And uh, he's just an incredible, incredible mind talking about uh, the synthesis of all religions and what this new world spirituality is going to look like. And Saturday night in particular is his keynote. And uh, I know there's going to be a lots of music with this event. Uh, you really want to check this out. If you're at all interested in um, religion, 21st century religion, uh, really enlightened religion, 
uh, and the various methods of healing available through that. Matthew Fox, just an incredible, incredible voice. Uh, he was here last year, and uh, this is really one not to be missed, uh, at least some part of it. And then, of course, uh, a third major world-known spiritual person is going to be in Pittsburgh on that same weekend, and that's Swamiji, Swami Satyajananda, I believe it's pronounced, although I could be wrong. Uh, he is the founder of the uh, 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 Dada Retreat Center, what they now call the Jesus Dada Retreat Center up near Slippery Rock. This is a really powerfully profound spiritual place. Uh, he, Swamiji, actually dreamed of these rocks before this land was donated to him. Uh, and now he's got a great center that's happening there. So he's got a uh, four-day Kriya Yoga course and international conference happening. If you're serious or at all interested in Kriya Yoga, this is, uh, he's one of the major heavy hitters and he is somebody uh, that you really don't want to miss. So uh, a great opportunity going up to uh, the dotaretreatcenter.org to find out more about that. And then on June 26th, this is also going to be pretty exciting. The Centerpoint Sleep Centers in McMurray, uh, and there's a bunch of them around town, they're going to be expanding into lifestyle medicine. They're offering up some of their space on a shared basis and uh, looking for uh, DOs, NDs, MDs, uh, anybody with any initials after their name who practice in integrative medicine or lifestyle medicine, uh, if you're looking to share office space and uh, some specific marketing or billing code support or various different uh, office kinds of uh, support are available. More information is going to be at the open house on June 26 at the McMurray Center. It's a beautiful center right next to the Pizza Hut. Can't miss it right there in the heart of uh, McMurray. So that's just a, what's going on in June. And in uh, July, one thing we know about is the World Magazine Yoga Fest. And that's coming up at uh, Point State Park on July 26th. You can head on over to worldmagazine.com slash yogafest to find out uh, who the headliners are going to be this year. This is the third year in a row. I know the first two years I had lots of rain. Let's hope, uh, let's hope they get this one off the ground dry this year. No rain, no rain. So that's the calendar. Be sure to check out Journal of Lifestyle Medicine uh, regularly and watch our Facebook and all sorts of places where we post what's happening in uh, in, in western Pennsylvania. So this weekend I had a chance to um, have a conversation with somebody you've seen on uh, as a reporter for several years on WTAE Action News. Uh, very talented guy. I always love to see his reporting. Very serious reporter. Uh, but I, you know, I always kind of thought he had a big heart. And uh, we had a conversation this weekend and you will find out that he actually does have a, a, a very big heart. Uh, the guy's in great shape. Uh, works out uh, a lot, and he'll talk about that, and also follows a very strict, uh, well, fairly strict, uh, well, actually not that strict, but uh, a very healthy diet, and um, you saw one of his recipes, a video smoothie recipe here on our podcast last week. So here's my conversation with Sheldon Ingram. And Sheldon, you probably know, is a TV reporter with WTAE-TV, and he's also made a little bit of a career move. Now he is a CHHC, and I'm hoping the first thing we're going to find out from Sheldon is what exactly that is. How are you doing today, Sheldon? I'm doing well. Certified Holistic Health Coach. Certified. And, uh, Go ahead. Yeah, Tell us Certified what that. Holistic Health Coach, yeah. Um, I uh, studied at uh, the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, which is out of New York, and uh, throughout uh, 2013 and graduated in December receiving my certification as a, a certified holistic health coach and uh, currently finishing up the uh, postgraduate program. And, uh, but in addition to that, I also uh, enrolled in the T. Colin Campbell uh, for Nutritional Studies, School of uh, Nutritional Studies at Cornell University to receive a uh, certification in plant-based nutrition. Oh, excellent, excellent. Now, anybody that's seen you, especially uh, if you hold your arms up right now, anybody seen you <laughs> in a t-shirt uh, knows you've got some biceps on you. You have got some guns there. How, um, so obviously you work out quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. And you are, you are, you're coming uh, right here in, on full view of the internet to tell us you're a vegetarian, uh, you're a, you're a plant-based diet guy? Well, I I like to call myself a nutritarian. Uh, 
a new meeting tree. That, uh, yeah, yeah, meeting. I'm going for everything that has uh, dense uh, nutrient presence. Um, but I'm not solely a vegetarian. I, w I would say that two thirds of my meal meals throughout the week are vegetarian meals. Okay. So I might eat some fish. I'll eat fish and a little bit of chicken, uh, maybe four times a week. Okay. But um, by and large, you you do eat mostly the plant based. Uh, we watched your uh, smoothie uh, video on last week's podcast, and I noticed you were just heaping in the plant protein there. Have you have you found that really gives you a lot of energy? Yeah. Um, I, I strongly believe in plant-based uh, protein for, for a number of reasons. Um, the first reason really has to do with what's wrong with our meat supply in the country. And um, it is very uh, mistrusting, if you will. And um, so I study you know, plant-based nutrition in co comparison to uh, meat-based uh, nutrition or uh, meat-based protein, if you will. And um, there are a lot of new age athletes who are now gravitating to plant-based protein and plant-based nutrition. Um, it's a cleaner form of protein. It doesn't, uh, is not absorbed in the body as quickly as your meat-based protein or your whey proteins, but your body will still absorb it, just not at the rate as the traditional means of protein. Um, athletes have been known to recover quicker. Um, muscle repairs um, happen quicker. Uh, with plant protein and I've been taking a variety of protein powders for 20 some years and I the protein powder that I use now is a plant-based protein and it's the best I've ever had. Hmm. Do, uh, it's been my experience and you, you've been through the school now so maybe you can tell us. Um, when I eat more meat it seems like my workouts generate more uh, lactic acid in my muscles. My muscles ache more the next day or two days later when I'm eating more meat than when I don't. Is that is that scientifically backed up? It's not necessarily scientifically scientifically backed up. It is uh, something that's being chronicled based on testimonies uh, from athletes. And what you are feeling with that lactic acid buildup is what prevents athletes from recovering quicker from right. strenuous workouts. And I'm not talking about injuries or anything like that. I'm just talking about the normal stress of athletic performance and what that does to the muscle fibers. And that lactic acid that you're talking about, that's what's preventing, um, in part, uh, muscles from recovering as quickly as they should. So now you get people involved with plant-based protein with the phytonutrients that come with that. Um, that protein um, has more properties um, added to it to facilitate leaner muscles, um, quicker recovery, a quicker response time in terms of recovery to the stress that's put on those muscles. When you when you do eat meat, do you generally go for the grass-fed beef then? And try to Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, grass-fed meat, uh, I don't eat red meat at all, but um, for the most part. But um, I always tell people that when you, if you're going to eat red meat, try to go for the grass-fed meat because you're looking at uh, the omega-3 uh, fatty acids that are necessary for our bodies. That's what you're going to find inside of uh, the grass-fed meat, uh, opposed to some of the other things that uh, the animals are fed, um, you know, free-range chickens and, and things of that nature. Well, I think you, you know, it's a really good issue you bring up with the safety of meat because um, especially with chicken, then I'm, I'm assuming you do like organic and no antibiotics and so forth. And with um, your, uh, with the rest of your diet, you try to stay organic. I absolutely try to stay organic, and I think one of the problems, you, you, you know, since we're going to talk the kick of protein and the meat supply, what people need to realize is that the more protein we take in, in terms of the meat that we eat, the higher the risk for cancer and other chronic diseases and there is a basic fundamental uh, uh, knowledge about our meat supply in that it's loaded with carcinogens. Uh, our meat supplies it, it supply is loaded with carcinogens and those carcinogens are the properties and the agents that conflict with our gene profiles and um, start the first stages of uh, mass and, and, and uh, cancerous mass in our bodies. So um, that 
that's why I said very at the very beginning, I'm very leery about meat supply in, in terms of the way it's produced, these manufactured farms and so forth. And I would go as far as telling people to go to your local farms where you know um, these animals are grazing on grass and, and, and even venture to ask the farmer or the owners of the farm if they graze on grass that is free from lawnmowers and tractors because if they're grazing on grass that is mowed with industrial machinery then they're doing nothing but ingesting loads of carcinogens which will be passed on to us. It, it truly is amazing the number of ways that uh, toxins can in, get into our food supply. Do you have any concerns right now about the seafood? Uh, Neil Bernard of the Physicians Council of Responsible Medicine recently said he, he has stopped eating seafood altogether because of the heavy metals particularly and now the, the issues of radiation in the Pacific Ocean. Exactly. And, and, and that's, that's definitely an individual choice for the person. While I still eat seafood, um, I try to stay away from farm-raised seafood. You know, basically given, I mean, that's just another form of a manufactured farming, but we're just talking about marine life. And so I, I try to encourage people to eat um, wild, you know, wild salmon or wild-caught fish. And um, But when you look at, the, and I'm not really well-versed in our um, in the marine life and the oceanic conditions um, in which our food supply comes from, but um, th I know, generally speaking, that there is great concern about uh, the condition of our water and, and because what you're looking at is a lot of runoff on some of these farms that we were talking about earlier. There is excessive runoff from a lot of these waters, uh, these farms rather, that's affecting the water where our food supply comes from out of the ocean and out of rivers. And, and streams and so forth. So that is a growing concern. And, you know, it's, it's a cyclical uh, uh, dilemma that we're dealing with. And um, to not eat seafood at all, I think it'd be a bit extreme for some folks. I'm going st to still eat it, but it still signifies that there's a red flag there, you know. Okay. And, and for him not to want to eat seafood anymore, it, it signifies that there's something very, very serious that we have to look at. And I know for a fact that there is runoff from these dusty, corroded farms where we're manufacturing things that's running off into our water supply. And our fish are ingesting that stuff. So they're, you know, they're just as bad off as, as you know, the cows and some of these cramped manufactured farms that we've seen in some of these documentaries that have, that have surfaced. Yeah, yeah. So uh, most people know you as a TV reporter, and this this uh, must be uh, kind of an interesting experience for you now being interviewed instead of doing asking the questions. Uh, tell us how uh, what made you make the switch? What made you uh, become a health coach? Well, you know what um, it, it's, it's a very interesting question. Um, it, it actually goes back to when I was a teenager, and you know, you and I we, are, we we've had some discussions about food as medicine, and uh, I say amen to that firsthand testimony um, what you know I get a lot of compliments uh, about my skin um, all the time but people don't even realize that when I was a teenager and into my early 20s as a young adult I had a very severe severe problem with eczema hmm. and um, at the time I remember going to dermatologists and they said they don't know what causes eczema you know there, there is you know there's no hard fact to say yes that is the agent that caused eczema stay away from it and so you, you're just kinda drifting taking medication trying to hope that it gets better and the one thing I kind of surmised and, and the dermatologist did agree with was that it has to be something in the blood that's affecting the skin and so I'm thinking that whatever is wrong with my blood I'm probably ingesting something that's affecting my blood. So I started doing food experiments and these food experiments experiments they lasted for years. You know, you're dealing with dairy, you're dealing with white flour, you're dealing with excess sugar, um, you're dealing with heavy acid food, acidic foods, things of that nature. And once I started doing these food allergy experiments, I began to realize that um, my skin started to clear up. So I remember I would go through a tube of uh, medication, topical medication for my eczema, big old tube I go through it in one month. And over the years, I uh, 
stop using that that medication and, and, and the further along I went, the more educated I became, the less of that medication I was using. It got to a point where I basically cleaned my diet up so well that I eradicated eczema from my skin condition altogether. And um, so I don't even use medication anymore. That was the first sign to me that food um, can really affect, bad food can affect you and good food can affect you. That was my discovery, and that was the first step to getting further involved into nutrition. Now, in terms of becoming a health coach, um, I tried the, the bird, my very first clients long before I decided to do this with my parents. And so <clears throat> when my parents turned 60, I went to both of them. I said, I want you to change the way you eat. I want you to incorporate exercise into your lives, and I want you to start taking good nutritional supplements. My mother followed the script. My father did not. Five years later, my mother lost 35 pounds. Or three years later, she lost 35 pounds at 63. My father developed several chronic conditions, which led to cancer. And by the time he was 71, 11 years after I went to them with this challenge, he passed away. And my mother, if, you, if I have you look at my mother from behind, as she's walking, as she's doing whatever, you would never guess that my mother is 74 years old. Um, she works out in the gym. She runs the stairs. She's a member of a line dancing club. She travels the country line dancing. She's living a vibrant, vigorous life. She practices good nutrition. She takes some nutritional supplements. And she, she takes her health seriously because she values herself. And so that was... Uh, four and a half years ago, four, so it was four and a half years ago, once I saw the life my mother was living and I saw my father's demise, that was the deal. That, that sealed the deal that I should get into um, the wellness industry to try to help people improve their lives. If people want to hear the good news of nutrition and how well uh, we can eat to have a powerful eating pattern to their lives, then I want to offer it to them. And, and that, was, that was pretty much the, the decision I made about four and a half years ago upon my father's death. Um, there are so many different targets of our society that I want to really connect with in terms of nutrition and overall wellness um, that there's so much out there that it, it'll keep me busy for years to come. Um, churches, um, large groups of people, you know. One of my mentors says that, said that uh, churches send people to heaven too early. <laughs> and uh, based on the way they're eating. And it's the truth. It is the well, truth. Yeah, you know, I found um, when, when I start talking to, to people about food as medicine, I find some of the most receptive people are pastors and ministers uh, because they've got a flock and they usually understand their flock is a little bit too heavy. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah that's, a very good, that's a very good place. And now you're also working with Diane Dean and Epiphany, which is a... Uh, uh, it's a counseling and holistic health center in Murraysville. Tell us a little bit about that. Exactly. Uh, you know, one of my uh, schoolmates, uh, she first told me about Diane, and then I had a chance to meet Diane, and she has some really, really great ideas in terms of overall wellness. She has a, a strong team of counselors uh, dealing with wellness in a variety of areas, not just with food, um, but uh, alternative means of medicine, if you will, um, natural body healing uh, techniques and um, from the emotional standpoint to the physical standpoint. Um, so she has a lot that she's trying to do. She is really rebirthing Epiphany and giving Epiphany um, a greater reach and um, broadening the purpose and the, 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 the paradigm upon which you know, wellness is addressed. And so uh, she's excited about it. Um, I'm excited about it. Uh, she has a wonderful team of uh, health coaches working with her, or counselors working with her. And I just joined in March. So brand new uh, to the Epiphany team. But, uh, you know, we just had a meeting, team meeting just this week. And uh, so there's some ex exciting things that we're doing, and we want to make a big reach in the eastern suburbs uh, of the area, and you know, and even further into Pittsburgh. She has a great network of people that she's connected with, and uh, we're looking to do some great things. So when when somebody comes to you and they sit down, we have a one-on-one. -on -one, 
what are what are some of the most important things you you look at first, or what is what are your specialties? What do you want to help people with the most? Well, I want to help people with weight loss. You know, I specialize in weight loss, and then I also have a component where uh, I teach the unique steps of healthy aging. And so the unique steps of healthy aging encompasses that whole holistic approach to living, not just what you eat, but the relationships you have, the type of job environment you have, your social settings, your, your finances, your spiritual life, because all of those things work together to build you up or to pull you down. And all of them affect how you eat. Because whether we consider ourselves emotional people or not as individuals, we are emotional eaters, every single one of us. And we have to recognize that there are some areas in our lives that are more stable than others. others, And that will directly affect how we eat. So when I deal with the unique steps of healthy aging, I'm dealing with that holistic approach. And I have clients enrolled in some of those programs um, who are trying to get their, you know, their, their lives back together. One of my clients... Um, you know, I just met with her last night, and she's uh, interested in doing this detox program that I have. And uh, I, you know, I had to tell her. I said, "Hey, you know, you have a lot of junk in your life that we have to get straightened out because we have to get you centered mentally and emotionally before you can start worrying about nutrition." And uh, that is the first thing I want my clients to uh, accomplish: is a sense of self-love. Self-love is the first principle that I preach and share and practice with my clients because if you don't love yourself, it doesn't matter what people tell you. You have to value your life. You have to value your mind, your body, the path you're walking, and the journey that you're taking. If you place a high degree of value on you, you're going to make very strong decisions that affect the next step you take in life. So a lot of people, they do diets and things like that because people are telling them to do it, not because they believe in themselves. And so with me, I want my clients to believe in themselves, to place supreme reverence, value on themselves so that they can make the proper decisions from there because everything else is downhill after that. And so that's the first thing I try to uh, connect with, with my patients, uh, with my clients rather, uh, is self-love. And then you start working with everything else. Well, that's beautifully said, and it's uh, it's great that you've got that whole team of people there with Epiphany to to help with that uh, with some of the deeper psychological issues. Right. I know from the work I do with uh, a psychiatrist out in Export that uh, you know, like you say, it all does go together. If if it doesn't matter how many times somebody tells you to eat broccoli, if you don't feel good about yourself, you're not going to do it. Exactly. Uh, we've had. Uh, a couple of, actually two doctors on our program tell us uh, the most important medicine is to be happy. And uh, one, I, I'm going to get your comment on this next one here. One doctor told us that uh, the one single most thing, the, the most important thing you can do every day is 30 minutes of exercise. So let's hmm. talk about exercise a little bit. How does that factor into your, your coaching and your whole plan? Well, exercise, there are three components uh, to wellness uh, in terms of the physical standpoint, and that's uh, nutrition, what you eat, exercise, and rest. I stress rest, and um, I'm even teaching my clients how to get a good night's sleep, um, but exercise is important, and I, I recommend that people engage in some kind of fitness um, four to five days a week, um, at least 30 minutes a day, 30 to 45 minutes a day, an hour if you can go there. But, uh, you know, even parents who have children who don't want to play sports, I always tell parents in a, in, a, in a joking way, if your child has one leg, get them out there to play sports. Get them moving. Do something. There's no excuse for anyone not to do something. And um, so exercise doesn't have to be as intense and vigorous as I would do it or an, a professional athlete would do it, would do rather. Um, it could be as simple as walking, a nice vigorous walk, taking the stairs instead of the, uh, escal the uh, elevator at work. Uh, it, simple things, park your car a good distance from the front door of the shop, the grocery store or the department store and walk the length of the parking lot. 
instead of trying to find a spot closer. Find ways to engage your body, whether you're in the gym or outside the gym. So fitness and exercise is very important. Um, I don't. Again, I think the most important thing is that you invest in you. I'm trying to get uh, my clients to spend anywhere from five to ten minutes every morning and every night by themselves, where mm -hmm. they can just engage in some deep breathing and focus on them. And I always tell folks the last thing that's on your mind when you go to bed is the first thing that's going to be on your mind when you wake up. So focus on the goodness of you when you go to sleep, and then you focus on the goodness of you when you wake up in the morning. That's awesomely said. Awesomely said. Um, we've covered a lot of ground, and I want to make sure that uh, we cover everything you wanted to cover. But I want there's two things I wanted to go back and touch on real quick. I thought were really good points. You had talked about doing uh, food experiments as a way of identifying those triggers for yeah. your eczema. And I would think eczema would be a pretty serious problem for a TV reporter. What did you ever? First of all, did you ever find out which specific trigger or triggers it was for you? And talk a little bit more about the importance of those food experiments and how cutting those things out of your diet and then reintroducing you get a real sense of empowerment by learning with your own body and using your own body as an instrument to, to detect that. That that is that you know that is so key. What you just said, using your own body as an instru instrument as a barometer. Um, here it is, your body is the victim of what you're eating, but yet it's still strong enough to give you signals and indications as to where you need to go. And uh, our bodies, I always tell people, our bodies are three times stronger than we give them credit for, than we, than we give credit for. And we ha our bodies just need a chance because our lungs don't stop breathing. The heart doesn't stop beating. The brain doesn't stop working. It's our actions that get in the way of those things functioning as they should. So um, there are a variety of um, food testing practices or exercises that people can engage in. Um, as for me, I didn't. I know that dairy um, was a major factor in, in, in eczema. I found out that corn um, is a food item that uh, exacerbates eczema. And psoriasis and things of that nature. So, um, but I, you know, I, I the white flour uh, is something that I don't do a lot of, and, and and a lot of the sugar. I think sugar, excessive amounts of sugar, also um, represented an irritation to the skin. And while there's nothing scientific that I can lean on um, to 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 prove that, um, I will lean on my intuition. And uh, intuition is so important, and, and it's basically listening to your body. And all I know is that I got good results out of certain foods I've eliminated from my diet. And uh, it goes back to eating what's natural, what's green, what's rich in nutrients. And, um, you know, I, I can honestly say for eczema is probably not, it could be not as much as what you're putting in as much as what you're leaving out because if you're not getting good nutrients in your body then it's hard for your blood to be purified if you're taking in if, if 30 percent of the food that you're taking in has nutri uh, nutritional value then that's 70 percent of junk going into your blood every day and that's there's a good chance that it's going to mess you up in some kind of way it's that much harder your liver has to work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So that's uh, that's the next thing I wanted to actually get into is a little bit about detoxing or detoxing, which <laughs> whatever way you'd like to pronounce it. Um, you mentioned that you have a detox program. Tell us a little bit about that. How do you detox with your co with your clients? Well, you know, it's, it's a program that I'm designing that I'm going to put on my website uh, within the next uh, six weeks. And, um, you know, there are a lot of theories in terms of what goes into a good detox program. But the basic thing that I, I tell my clients is that um, you want to give the liver a break. You want to give it a vacation. Um, you know, we all talk about needing a vacation to get away from work, to get away from this, whatever. Our liver needs to get away from the junk that we're putting inside of it. Um, our liver works so hard to sort out the crap that we're ingesting, it needs a break. Um, it it allows, you know, when you do a good detox, it allows that liver to get a break, but it also allows you to focus on strong nutrients that go into your body 
and a lot of water to help flush the system, to help give uh, nourish your organs, to uh, you know just facilitate an overall good feeling of wellness with the body. And uh, I'm not going to go into detail right now about all the things I put in to the foods that we eat uh, in my detox program, but you know I have a seven day and a 21 day. And uh, I mean, you'll get a variety of days of detox programs if you go online. You got a fat detox, a liver detox, you know, seven day, ten day, twenty one day. My theory is that the worse off you are in terms of your eating habits, the longer that detox program should go on because you need a phase in period. You need people. You cannot just jump into a detox program because most people have failed. Most bodies are not ready for that shock treatment. So you want to gradually get your body there then get into the core of it, and then gradually come out of it. That's what the 21 day is for. And then for the seven day detox program, I have folks who are reasonably well with the way they eat. They don't need as much of an adjustment so they can do the seven day detox program. But ultimately, you know, I have people doing a 48 hour water fast. And by the time they do that 48 hour water fast, um, they're ready for it. And it's a gradual move to that particular point that's the um, you know that's the highlight that's the core of that detox program uh, and the whole time you're putting nutrients in your body there's not one time when you're not putting something nutritional uh, nutritious rather in your body during this detox program you know the benefit is that you're going to lose weight um, you're going to take the first steps to improving your skin um, your alertness is going to be great your, your energy level is going to be good even though you're on a liquid diet so to speak you're still you're not going to sacrifice much of your energy um, and, and people they have a hard time wrapping their arms around that for those who are not experienced in detox but it's true and I think people who are experienced with detox will tell you that you can continue your normal life and not sacrifice anything uh, on a good detox program as long as you're continually continually putting good nutrients in your body as you detox yeah. Well, well said. Uh, you, you sign me up. Uh, <laughs> you know, anything, anything that uh, gets you more energy. I think that's what everybody's looking for these days. Yeah, yeah. You always yeah. hear that. Well, I'm too tired to exercise, but it's really the more exercise is what would make you less tired. You know, so it's one of those vicious circles. Yeah, and and, and more exercise is going to compel you to eat better as well. Absolutely, and I I found that just when you're in better shape. It's just easier to be more aware. Uh, you just are naturally more mindful of every little aspect of, of your body. The, your experience too with it? You know what? You, you said something that's very key. Um, you said you're very aware and mindful. This, the mind, is such a precious thing. And um, I, I try to tell people that um, the folks between the ages of 40 and 60 are at the best optimal time in their lives to slow down the onset of Alzheimer's and dementia. And so being mindful and aware of your body, your, your presence, your time in, in life, your journey, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, is key. And uh, yeah, exercise does facilitate that. And if you can think about who you are, what you're doing, that's good. Um, my clients are telling me, like, Sheldon, um, you know, you really have to put some thought into what you're eating on a weekly basis. You can't just go on a whim and just pick up anything. You have to think about what you're eating. It, it requires a lot of thought. And I said, that's good. Exactly. So now you're thinking about yourself. You're placing value on you. And that's what I want. So if you have to sit down there and write down and plot what you're going to eat, good. The more thought you can put into your life, into your body, into your food supply, the better. That's a problem that most people don't think. They don't think. And you know what? There's nothing scientific spend, there's nothing scientific to it, but I say in, in, in conversation that the marketing and propaganda of fast food is so intense mm -hmm. that I've literally seen toddlers recognize the McDonald's emblem before they can actually speak a complete sentence. Mm. Yeah, well, that's uh, that actually you could get us into a whole other topic here, and I just want to uh, just very briefly talk about this. But one of the reasons that I created the journal was to help uh, put some different voices out there and give voice to the professionals who are on the front line 
who are actually using integrative methods, who are actually practicing food as medicine, who understand the mind-body connection and use it as a part of their practice. And to give a voice to that, you know, those professionals, and I also find a way to connect with journalists who maybe want to tell that story. What, give us your overall, just your brief opinion on how, I mean, we've, we've just spent 30 minutes plus here talking about some very important topics, and these are topics you don't generally see on the evening news. You know, how, just give a commentary on the, the nature of the state of reporting on uh, these very important facts that really affect our lives much more than, you know, a car crash in New Mexico or something. Well, the paradigm of TV news, whether you're talking about Pittsburgh or any other city, um, is to um, report what's grim, what's destructive, and what's eroding society. I call it a very lazy approach to news. Um, I don't know why it's that way, but that's the paradigm upon which conventional modern television news operates. Now, you, if you think about it, some of the best television documentaries that we see on food are usually in niche mediums. So fed up, where is that being seen? in the movie theaters. You know, you have to go to niche television mediums to see these valuable documentaries and film pieces that are being put together to educate the public on our food supply. They're not on mainstream media. They're not. You're going to have to get them downloaded. You're going to have to get the DVD. You're going to have to go into a movie theater. You're going to have to go into select areas and select mediums to get this information, to get these visual uh, information pieces. And you're not going to see them, generally speaking, on uh, in, in, in mainstream television. And so uh, I don't know why it's that way, but it is. Yeah. Well, I, I found it to be an incredibly uh, negative environment in the traditional side of things. Uh, I, I've met a lot of extremely egotistical and negative people in the industry, and I'm very happy to uh, find that you are not one of them. So uh, well, thank you. It's been a great, it's been a great pleasure, great pleasure, uh, this conversation, and I wish you the best of luck. I definitely want to uh, give people a chance to uh, explore Epiphany. Um, that's uh, epiphanyweb.net, www.epiphanyweb.net. Um, that's Diane Dean's uh, Wellness Center, and that's where we're doing a lot of work. You know, the world's too big. Uh, to just sit back and just do one thing. Um, you know, the world is bigger than TV. Um, there, there are people to reach and, and, and things to share with folks. So I'm stepping outside. I'm, while I'm still doing television, I'm stepping outside the, uh, the walls of TV to, uh, to reach a greater mass of people uh, any way I can. That's great. Oh, uh, that's, I think that's the quote of the day is, the world is bigger than TV. And coming from you, that's, that's a great quote. <laughs> well, thanks again, Sheldon, and uh, we'll have you back uh, soon, I hope. Well, thank you so much for your time, and uh, to all those who watch this video, I, I appreciate your time as well. And uh, you keep up the great work because you're doing a great thing. Okay. Thank you very much. You take care. Thank you. Take care now. So that's it for this week on the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine podcast. Uh, be sure to look for our print edition out on the streets. Look forward in your favorite locations. Email me at svenhosford at gmail.com if you uh, know of some places you'd like to have it. Or you can go up onto our website and uh, log in there and tell us where we should have the magazine. We're on Facebook. We're on iTunes, YouTube, Spreaker, Stitcher, and, of course, journaloflifestylemedicine.com. If you are an IMP, an integrative medicine professional, be sure to check out the Meetup group, Integrative Medicine Professionals on meetup.com. And until next week, hey, Yins, be careful out there.